hello and welcome to another weekly Dividend Cafe podcast and video. I am really excited to be recording from our New York studio. And I emphasize New York because the Dividend Cafe today is going to be about the first ever New York SALT conference. And so I want to recap for you a number of the takeaways that I had from this extraordinary event this week. It was here in New York City. For those who aren't familiar with the SALT conference, I'll try to do this very quickly. I kind of gave a little longer historical deal in uh, the written Dividend Cafe. Um, SALT was a alternative investment conference that was started by my friend, Anthony Scaramucci, uh, back post-financial crisis in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis as his sort of um, contribution to what was just the dying economy in Las Vegas. The, con- the corporate conventions had gone away altogether. There was a sort of infamous or famous or whatever you want to call it moment where President Obama said, now is not the time to be going to Las Vegas. And you took an already really hammered city and it, it kind of hammered it more. And, and so Anthony decided his part would be to bring a lot of hedge funders and money managers and folks, you know, from New York. He, he was in that business, still is to this day with his uh, hedge fund firm uh, and create a, a conference. And over the years, it grew substantially. I've attended almost every year, I think, but one year um, out in Las Vegas. And it became, you know, a major event. President, former presidents Clinton and Bush spoke uh, before he was president. Uh, Joe Biden spoke. Um, but I mean, really significant, like evening entertainment. Some really big, you know, groups would come and. And yet in the daytime, you really had just kind of a, a who's who, the A-lister, so to speak, of folks in uh, hedge funds, in, in Wall Street, in Hollywood, in Washington, D.C., public policy, uh, and, and then really even developed in more in science and innovation and technology. Very well done event. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, first time I ever spoke at the event was in 2019 in, in Vegas. Enjoyed that a great deal. Uh, But then in 2020, it was canceled in the immediate aftermath of all the lockdowns during the spring, uh, of course, through through COVID. So the reason I say first time ever in New York is in in kind of keeping to the the history and the legacy of what SALT was in Vegas, uh, Anthony chose to do it at the Javits Center in New York City this week, and New York being the desired location for the very reason that Vegas was chosen before, the um, economic impact in New York City, the amount of people that have left the city, uh, having financial markets and so many things have impacted the way they were. Uh, look, it, it, was, it was a very tough period through COVID for, for much of the country, but obviously I think the epicenter will always be sort of thought of as the Big Apple. And so the kind of, uh, I think, symbolic message about reopening, about normalization, about getting our lives back, and about the fact that we just simply cannot live our lives on a computer screen, that these things need to happen in person. And I've been a part of a lot of virtual conferences since um, COVID. I've spoken at plenty, but I've even listened to many, many more than I would like. There's some I just refuse to listen to anymore or be a part of, including ones that I've like never missed, but I just am done with it. I, I want to be back together. I want people face-to-face and, and that kind of interaction. And to see 3,000 people come to Javits Center, this beautiful new center that they've opened. Um, it's like the new wing of the Javits Center um, right on the Hudson River in New York. It was absolutely energizing. And his gamble paid off. You know, There were just a ton of people that obviously feel the same way about this that I do. And so it was an energizing and encouraging event to be a part of, to attend. But on an investment standpoint, there are a number of things I want to be able to share um, with you. And so, you know, for purposes of the of the podcast and, and the video, I want to try to edit as much as I can, because I just said we can't go through everything. But there are a few d- takeaways that, that I want to spend some time on. The um, the overall theme, I guess, you know, there's all these different angles I could talk about. We, we talk about the juxtaposition of policy and markets right now. 
Um, different things with the Fed, uh, although that was not as obsessive of a theme this week as perhaps it's been, you know, in, in Bonson land and dividend cafe land and whatnot this year. Uh, a lot on crypto um, from some of the different conference speakers and panels that they had put together. Um, some A-lister type hedge fund guys who, who spoke and, and, and really, I think, provided incredibly valuable insights, some of which I'm allowed to share, some of which I'm not. They did some off the record stuff. But uh, Steve Cohen, uh, Daniel Loeb, uh, Ray Dalio, you know, these are some of the, the biggest names in, in that industry. And, and obviously, when they talk, a lot of people listen, including myself. Uh, and, and there was a, a significant amount of interest in the subject of the opportunities right now in investment markets. We know how expensive equities are. We know how low bond yields are. And where do people think there's value? And, and, and I was really taken back by the contrast of the distress opportunity, you know, deep value, stuff that really got hammered and now could be bought for pretty cheap and potentially provide investors exposure to really outsized returns. And it, this has got to be um, the biggest difference from an investment standpoint between the 2008 moment and the 2020 moment, where the bulk of things that became deeply distressed out of COVID, it, it lasted in some cases for a few hours. And even in the cases of highly illiquid assets, real estate, credit, um, some of these more idiosyncratic things, it may have lasted a couple of weeks where there was true deep value, dislocation in price post-2008, still in the marketplace in like 2011, two, three years later. And a lot of that had to do with the Fed, some of the Fed's aggressive and quick actions, compressed spreads and, and, and flooded liquidity and took away a lot of it. A lot of it had to do with the nature of what was um, creating distress. You know, in 28, there was a very systemic solvency problem. And in 2020, it was much more um, transitory around the nature of the virus, the uncertainty of the virus. And there was a bazooka of fiscal and monetary response that came from that. Um, I believe that the credit lesson in this is very important because you have the COVID moment, you have what took place in March, 2020, but you also have well before COVID and well after, the fact that we live in a different world than post financial than, than financial crisis, the post financial crisis world, the Dodd Frank world, is one where the commercial banks have been largely disintermediated. They have no interest really in lending against anything other than assets. So cash flow lenders are largely non bank lenders, and this is where the structured credit opportunity comes. This is where the private credit opportunity comes, and this is where yield is mostly available. There are liquidity issues. There are obviously credit risk issues to some degree, but a lot of this exists very, very high atop the capital structure. Uh, first lien, senior, secured type loans um, uh, guaranteed by the entire asset base and capital stack of the company. Um, senior claim on cash flows. There are cases where there could be distress and, and uh, uh, you know, cre negative credit events. Uh, where, where defaults have to lead to recovery and recovery can take a long time, but recoveries can be very, very high. So there's a risk reward ratio here for those who don't have to worry about mark to market, for those who don't have to worry about daily net asset value. That to me remains an incredible opportunity. It was one we really liked before COVID. We did very well with throughout COVID, some of the private credit stuff, and then, and then even some of the more opportunistic structured credit we've added. Um, but I really encourage you to read Dividend Cafe this week to hear more about what we are talking about in that space, because I actually believe that um, it is a theme that needs to be understood in a post-COVID context now. Stuff that was at full par value that went down to 90 cents in the past, you know, you, you start wondering what's going on and analysts come in and they can research and they can do all of the work necessary to form an opinion. But when it just trades straight down to 50 cents, like it happened in March of 2020, there's no time to analyze. One of the really premier distressed managers who spoke at the event, not that the manager's distressed, but it's a manager who specializes in buying distressed assets, 
their their point was if you prioritized caution over speed, you couldn't have made money from it. The only way to have exploited the deep distress of the COVID moment was to just say, we're throwing away deliberation, we're throwing away caution because we have to act quickly. And those who did that were richly rewarded. Um, it's not the process I advocate. It's not our orientation for managers in that space. They may have been able to, to ring the cash register a bit, but buying a dollar for 50 cents is not on the table right now. It was barely on the table throughout COVID at all. It was on the table a lot longer post-financial crisis. Um, real estate's a very similar situation, by the way. You know, you know, related companies, which is one of the largest real estate owners here in New York City and, and other major markets, you know, it's a very substantial national real estate footprint. They have a huge multifamily portfolio in New York. They were having to give out rents. Uh, they, first of all, they were only about 80% occupied a year ago, and they were having to give away three or four months of free rent as concessions to get uh, some of their, their properties rented out. They're now at 99% occupancy with no concessions. They're giving away no free month, free months of rent. So the entire space, you know, um, in multifamily around the country has changed. High quality assets. I look at some of the returns we're seeing in some of our own diversified income real estate. Um, there, there's just a very high pay rate, uh, very high quality assets, uh, uh, very good for the owner not for the renter, favorable supply demand, uh, uh, you know, relationship. And so the real estate theme has actually been reasonably strong. I may have heard one manager this week um, say that they actually like the office and retail side right now from an acquisition standpoint, but most of the themes are on what we know to already be doing well, multifamily and, and uh, of course, industrial. Um, the hospitality space st is not bit trading poorly. Um, and the reason for that is most people are saying, yes, cash flows are impaired right now, but cash flows are going to be restored and they're being valued at five year pro forma, not one year pro forma. So there you go. Interesting environment. Um, I don't want to sit here and go through all of my notes on, I can't even see my notes, uh, without the right glasses. Um, I don't want to sit here and go through all the, the nuances about structured credit and direct lending. I do want you to read about those nuances, but I want you to kind of just understand in a nutshell that there is not a huge theme right now in the alternative in the, uh, investment world, I'm trying to figure out if the S&P should be at 26 times earnings or 21 times earnings. There's not a lot of people that don't know that we're late in the cycle of equity expansion, multiple expansion. Uh, these are not index investors that I spent a few days with this week. They're looking for opportunity. They have a, philosoph a philosophy. They have a theme. And I, I felt a lot of conviction around one particular hedge funder sharing that process of we have to formulate themes that we believe are investable. But then from the themes, we then have to investigate the people, the management, the leadership. And then from there, we have to execute. And that business has to execute or that investment opportunity has to execute. So from a theme to, to management to execution, I think is the right path for successful investing. It's one that um, kind of rhymes with a lot of what we believe in and do. And when I look around the hedge fund industry, I think a lot of underperforming funds or, or ill-equipped funds have, have died. That is incredibly Darwinian space, which I think is very good for capitalism. You want failures to go away and, and uh, best of breed to rise to the top. And there's a lot of forgiveness in other parts of the asset management industry that allow, you know, in, in financial repression, in 0% in interest rates, in heavy QE and monetary accommodation, some strategies and, and companies exist that otherwise wouldn't. And I'm not sure that's going to be the case for all of the next 10 years. So you see a lot of optimism from the active guys and the alpha guys and the alternative guys, the hedge fund guys and gals, of course, I forgive the figure of speech, that you don't see in the passive space. You don't see in the index. And I think that's for good reason. I think there's a lot of reason to fear some of the speculative ex excesses that exist in markets right now. And I think there's a lot of reason to be very optimistic 
where there is talent, where there is opportunity, where there is definable philosophy that is followed up with, with uh, good cogent execution. So those were some of my major takeaways from this delightful experience with SALT. Um, I'm gonna close you with four quick things. Something may pop, the various asset bubbles that may or may not exist out there, but it will not be the Fed. The Fed simply is at a point now, I'm not saying the Fed doesn't help create the asset bubbles, you know I believe they have. But uh, one of the speakers this week, I think shared some wonderful insights. The Fed can't do it, they're all in on the bubbles. That's not to say the bubbles can't burst, but it has to be another factor that bursts them, not, not the Fed. Um, I shared the, this one already, that investment opportunity path, theme, then people, then execution. Even when the Fed does taper, this is a mathematical statement that I did not realize, I, I, although I had never thought about it, but it was pointed out to me. When they begin tapering, let's say in December, January, Q1 of next year, they will still be buying more than at the peak of the QE post-financial crisis. So yeah, tapering, meaning the level of buying is coming down, that is tightening in the sense that there's less than there was before. But the absolute level is still going to be higher than when they were increasing uh, 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 quantitative easing post-crisis. Um, the central bank is not merely, and this is a line that Ray Dalio shared on the record, the central bank is not merely a buyer of debt, they are a holder. Their balance sheet is holding trillions of dollars. They are inherently invested now in downward pressure on rates. And I think this is just crucially important that we understand the reality where central banks around the world, including the, our own Fed, are. And then finally, just so I can address that issue of crypto, I talk about it more um, in, in Dividend Cafe. But uh, crypto is not an antidote to excess liquidity, which is a case a lot of folks make. It is caused by excess liquidity. The craze around a lot of the crypto space is being made possible by the excess liquidity. And yet so many believe it to be this sort of protection or immunity against excess liquidity. There's a real irony in there. So I um, enjoyed the conference a great deal. Enjoyed sharing some of these insights with you. I do feel that the writing better captures a lot of what I wanted to share than this kind of oral re, um, you know, repeating of, of some of it in for the podcast and, and the video. But um, hopefully, I've done my best for you. So we'll leave it there. We'll get off of the salt conference next week. I'll actually be back in California next week, and we will have a more normal dividend cafe next week, and one I look forward to a great deal. Um, as always, reach out with any questions, any comments, anything you want me to kind of rehash once you do read Dividend Cafe or have listened to this podcast. And I thank you as always for your time. Thank you for sending Dividend Cafe far and wide, uh, rating us, giving us the stars you feel are appropriate, uh, all, all that kind of stuff at your podcast player of choice. And uh, thank you for being a part of the Dividend Cafe.